joining from Sri Lanka. And uh, very good morning to Professor Eric Bogut, uh, joining from the USA as our guest speaker today. Uh, as the head of the department, uh, Department of Chemistry, University of Peradeniya, I am glad to welcome all of you to this special lecture organized by collaborating the Inspire and the ChemSoc teams of our department together. The uh, speech today is targeted for giving the opportunity for Sri Lankan students to learn the process of uh, US graduate applications and admission. Uh, we have invited almost all the undergraduate and graduate students from st the universities in Sri Lanka and some interested A-level students. Uh, I hope this lecture will be a very fruitful one for those who are interested to do their postgraduate studies uh, and further studies in the USA. So we are very grateful to our senior professor, Professor Gamini Rajapaksha, for introducing Professor Eric uh, Bogart of, to our, our team. And uh, without taking much time, I would like to invite uh, Professor Rajapaksha to introduce Professor Eric uh, Bogart to the audience. And uh, thank you very much. Have a pleasant evening. It's over to you, Professor Rajapaksha. Thank you, Professor Manu Devi. And uh, very good evening to all of you, almost all of you joining from Sri Lanka. And uh, very good morning to Professor Eric Berge, my good friend, and others, those who are joining from US. And it is indeed a great pleasure and, and a kind of honor for me to introduce uh, Professor Eric Berge to you. Actually, Professor Borge is giving this lecture, and this is the third consecutive time. This time, actually, with our new, uh, new developments in the department, uh, we were able to do it in a grand way uh, with the help of our uh, wonderful INSPIRE team and also uh, Chemical Society. So it's a, it's a joint event of our uh, INSPIRE team and the uh, Chemical Society of the Department of Chemistry, University of Peradeniya. Uh, dear students, colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as I said, it is uh, indeed a great pleasure and honor for me to introduce to you uh, my good friend, Professor Eric Borge, uh, who is today's speaker uh, of the very special INSPIRE lecture. Uh, professor Eric Boge is a, a, a professor in both analytical and physical chemistry at the Department of Chemistry, Temple University, USA. He received his, uh, his uh, BS from uh, France, I don't know whether I can pronounce it properly, Université de Paris, Sud, uh, France. I'm sorry if I not pronounced properly, and PhD from University of Pennsylvania, USA. He then worked as a postdoctoral uh, researcher at the Columbia University USA before joining the academic staff of the Temple University. Professor Borge is an honorary visiting professor uh, to many, many uh, international institutes, and he is, uh, he is uh, helping large number of international institutes, including uh, well-known IIT Bombay, and also he's a, he's a visiting professor in uh, uh, in so you have to unmute uh, oh unmute. sorry oh, it was so couldn't hear yeah and yeah you, oh, Last I'm, sorry. I'm sorry i'm sorry i i unmuted it somehow it has muted um, i'm sorry about that so uh, so let me start again. So, no, no, uh, you, you, when, you, you went up to IIT. Last part, if yeah, you just... yeah. Very good morning to all of you uh, joining from Sri Lanka and, uh, and, and very good evening and very good morning to Professor Eric Boge and those joining from uh, the Temple University. And Professor Manadev is our head of department, uh, new head of department. Now we have what is called INSPIRE uh, lecture series. And this is sixth lecture. And we have a wonderful INSPIRE team together with our Chemical Society of Department of Chemistry organized this very special lecture uh, of Professor Borge. And uh, uh, Professor Eric Borge is a professor in physical and analytical chemistry at the Department of Chemistry, Temple University, USA. 
He received his BS from University G. Paris, Sud, France, and PhD from University of Pennsylvania, USA. Uh, he then worked as a postdoc to research, postdoctoral researcher at the Columbia University USA before joining the academic staff of the Temple University. Professor Bogi is an honorary visiting professor to many uh, distinguished uh, institutes like IIT Bombay and a really high-grade institute in France, uh, a university in France, and also Japan. Uh, he, he is a fellow of both the American Physical Society and American Chemical Society. And he is a help in the JSPS program of the Japan as well. Uh, his research interests, as you saw, um, uh, span a horizon of um, multidisciplinary areas, including nanotechnology and nanoscale processes at interfaces, plasmonics, nonlinear optics, ultrafast dynamics, environmental chemistry, nanomaterials, scanning probe, microscopy, and sensors for biological and physical agents. So that is a very wide area where Professor Boge is working on at this university and helping all of us. Actually, we have a joint research grant now where Professor Boge is going to do a major part in this uh, optronics. Uh, he has been, uh, uh, I mean, uh, he has been given this very special lecture. Uh, this is the third consecutive time. Uh, previously, two times actually, it was not as colorful as this time because now we have this uh, inspired team, very young members, uh, uh, making it very colorful and beautiful. And uh, Chemical Society also helped them. So it's a joint event of the Insta team and the Chemical Society. And the maximum number that we can accommodate is 500. The 500 is up here. So therefore, the others are joining from YouTube. So I have a lot to uh, talk about him, but um, it's not the time. I, I should uh, hand over uh, this to Professor Boge. Uh, and uh, you, you will have a very special lecture on... Uh, not on the subject matter uh, particularly, but uh, on uh, to help you uh, to uh, uh, I mean help you to uh, uh, to make your application for graduate studies in USA. So as a personal note, actually, I mean he invited me for the first lecture uh, in the academic year 2018 uh, in in his department when I was working in uh, in the uh, Mississippi University. So I went there the day before uh, the lecture, and uh, luckily we had a lot of our, our students there, former students, they, uh, they are uh, Professor Borges and other students, and there's a big Sri Lankan community in Philadelphia and also in Washington, D.C., and I spent the whole weekend there. Uh, it's a very personal note. Uh, that previous day, actually, we spent about uh, until about 2 a.m., uh, because uh, the three guys there uh, prepared a great dinner as well as we had a lot of some organic compounds to drink, one simple organic compound. And under the influence of that uh, compound at about two o'clock, I ran alone that uh, uh, the pavement and, and fell down actually, injured my hand. So that is why I was wearing the coat all the time the following day. Anyway, it was a very fun, uh, fun and very wonderful day uh, the following day, as well as we had a great time at Temple University, and then I went to DC as well. So that is, uh, with that note, uh, let me invite uh, Professor Bogi to uh, uh, conduct his lecture. Professor Bogi, please. Well, uh, first of all, um, a few people I'd like to thank. First and foremost, uh, Professor Rajapaksi uh, for uh, inviting me to, uh, to share with you some, some insight on, on the graduate application process. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, the department chair who welcomed us and Dr. Thomas, who has also been helping to coordinate them and probably many other people who've contributed. I, I, I tuned in about 10 minutes before and I see you, you, you managed to locate our promotional material for Temple University, et cetera. So um, that, that's wonderful. I'd like to start the program uh, that the, by introducing uh, my friend and colleague, um, Dr. Uh, Dan um, Strongin, who's going to give you a, a brief overview of his research, uh, probably about 10 minutes. Uh, then we're gonna introduce and give you an overview of the department. 
Then I'm going to uh, go through this um, graduate school application process uh, presentation, and um, your uh, faculty have shared that information on the Zoom chat. So please download that for future references. I'll tell you a little bit about the origin of those materials. And then we'll have a Q&A answer. While most of this is focused on chemistry, uh, I would say that there are many similarities in the application process for other STEM discipline. And we'll be able to address what differences might exist in the Q&A answer. So um, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Daniel Strongen, who will tell you briefly about his research. Um, great, Dan, please go ahead. Great, great. Thank, thanks, Eric, for the introduction. And, th and thanks, everybody, for uh, being here. It's fi 500 participants, so it's uh, quite, quite impressive. Probably a, the biggest crowd I've ever given a talk to. So um, I'll talk a little bit about, just kind of give you a flavor let me see if I can share. Am I, do I have sharing capabilities? Um, it's up, down. good. Yeah, it is. Okay, okay, I'm gonna have to move my camera. Can everybody still see me? Hopefully. Okay, so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what, what goes on in the Strongen Lab at uh, Temple University, but but you know what's impressive about Temple University is over over twenty really uh, world class uh, research laboratories. So it's a tremendous place to be for students and and for faculty, of course. My projects kind of sit under the umbrella of surface chemistry and catalysis. We have two general areas looking for catalysis for sustainable energy and for environmental chemistry. And I also include a picture of my group here, but uh, that's at a baseball stadium, uh, America's favorite pastime. So uh, baseball is, uh, well, you get to go to a baseball game, you come to America. Um, the, um, okay, so let me talk really quickly because I've got about 10 minutes here, but I'll, I'll talk about two main projects going in in our group, just kind of give you a flavor of, of what happens. One is to do with environmental chemistry. And, and this is a little uh, strange this project because we're repurposing proteins to do environmental chemistry. And I'll kind of show you a, a little bit about what we do there. And in a second project, uh, we're, we're really undertaking uh, an effort to make a better water oxidation catalyst or essentially a water splitting catalyst to generate hydrogen for a sustainable energy. I'm going to just skip over this. Just it's suffice to say that we use a lot of different techniques. Uh, we are problem driven, not technique driven. We, we have on campus, we have very good electron microscopy, uh, x-ray diffraction. Uh, a lot of, a lot of I and a lot of my colleagues use uh, national synchrotron sources also to do uh, analytical uh, chemistry. So first project, what, what are we doing here? We're using repurposing a protein, uh, specifically ferritin. It's a protein we all have in our bodies. It's, uh, we have grams of this stuff in our body. And what it does is it sequesters iron, free iron in humans, in, in body and in human systems is quite toxic. So this protein has been developed by nature to sequester iron. And inside the protein, which is basically a hollow sphere, forms a small piece of iron oxide, essentially a piece of rust. And that's a small band gap semiconductor. And we can do uh, chemistry with that. Uh, this is just kind of showing what ferritin looks like. It's this uh, 12, it's 12 nanometers. It's a nano material, of course, uh, 12 nanometer diameter, and it's hollow inside. And we can put iron oxide in there. That's what nature does. We can also do that in a laboratory. We can also put other types of materials to do other types of uh, chemistry. Uh, this is just showing some of the transmission electron microscopy facilities that we have at Temple. Uh, in this case, what we're looking at is the mineral within the ferritin protein. These little dots are essentially little pieces of rust inside that ferritin protein. This is a 50 nanometer scale bar. On the right-hand side, these little white circles are actually the protein. These black dots are the iron oxide. Um, what we're interested in is, you know, for environmental chemistry is to remove 
uh, high value, high priority pollutants um, from aqueous systems. And the two, the two high priority pollutants are chromium and arsenic. Uh, and we can control the oxidation state of chromium six, which is a carcinogen, and we can convert it to chromium three with this by shining light on this protein system. And we're also interested in removing arsenic from uh, aqueous systems. And this is just kind of showing in a cuvette, this is ferritin in there, we can shine light and we can convert chromium six to chromium three using this protein. And what we're trying to do in our lab is understand how this happens. This is kind of, again, we're repurposing a protein. This is a cross section. This is our little small band gap semiconductor. We can shine light on it and do chemistry and the conversion of chromium six to chromium three. What we've done more recently is to make these into plasmonic materials. I'm not sure how many people out there are familiar with uh, plasmonic materials, but a, pl a plasmon is essentially a collective oscillation of electrons, free electrons in a small uh, metallic uh, material. Uh, in this case, what we're doing, these little purple spheres here are little gold particles that we're putting on the ferritin protein. Why do we do this? Uh, it allows us to capture more of the solar radiation. So the iron oxide within the ferritin can, can, can capture relatively short wavelength light. The gold particle can gather longer wavelength light so we can gather more solar radiation and we can transfer energy from this plasmonic particle into the iron oxide and do some chemistry while maintaining um, a wide swath of absorbance over the solar radiation. This is kind of uh, something that we've developed in our lab. We, this is a colloidal suspension of ferrite and gold, stable, uh, very stable. And we can use this to capture chromium. This is just showing chromium six on the Y axis here versus time, we shine light. And really the only thing I wanna get across here is you see this decreasing line here. This is the conversion or the removal of chromium six by shining light on this hybrid system where we have the protein with the gold particle. And this is the only system that does it. If you don't have the gold particle on it, it just doesn't occur. So because we're using light that can't excite the ferritin, it can excite the uh, gold. What we're doing is also trying to attach these protein onto different morphologies of gold. These are gold spheres. This is what I just showed you. This is a gold nanorod and this is a gold star. And why are we doing this? We can actually change the, uh, absorb uh, different swaths of solar radiation from visible into the near infrared. And we wanted potential applications will be catalysis as I showed you before, but we also wanna explore the use of these for photothermal therapy. A lot of people are using gold particles uh, to, um, for photothermal to ablate uh, tumor cells. Uh, by attaching ferritin. Fer actually, most of these tumor cells, they have receptors for ferritin. So the ferritin kind of drags the gold particle to the tumor. One can irradiate it with near infrared light and ablate the, ablate the uh, tumor. And that's kind of a long range goal of this project. A second project is looking at um, sustainable energy or more specifically splitting water to make hydrogen. Um, hydrogen is a potentially a really good fuel. It's um, clean, right? You can combust hydrogen and you make water. Um, the problem is, of course, you have to um, put in energy to split water, right? So this is just kind of showing the energy versus reaction profile for water. And the, you've got this activation barrier here to get water to H2 and O2. Uh, what we're key in on is trying to lower the height of this hill. And to lower the height of this hill, we develop catalytic systems to help us do that. Um, there's a, you know, the, the hydrogen economy has been around a long time, right? It was first proposed in 1923 um, as a replacement for uh, fossil fuels. So what we try to do, actually we use, we generally work with one of the half reactions for water splitting, and that is the oxidation of water. We wanna take water, and we wanna make O2. And to do that, electrochemically, 
you want, you want to put that on an anode and you increase the positive voltage on an anode and you start stripping electrons from the water to make O2. And we want to use as little voltage as possible to do this. And, and that takes the development of catalytic systems to do that. Uh, we used um, typical electrochemical equipment, conventional electrochemical equipment. What we've been concentrating on are 2D layered materials. So this is kind of showing sheets of a manganese oxide material we use. Um, these are manganese oxide sheet. Here's another sheet, here's another sheet. And what we do is manipulate this two dimensional layered system by putting metals inside. What we have found is by putting active metals for water oxidation in the interior or the interlayer, we can make them much more active than if they were alone. So this is the advantage of nano confining. So this kind of project is looking at the nano confinement of catalytic material to increase its intrinsic activity. We also make other types of materials. This is making um, kind of vertically aligned materials. Um, this is just showing what one sees in an experiment like this. This is oxygen product versus potential on an anode. I'm increasing the positive voltage here, and then you start seeing oxygen being evolved. And this is this particular data is just showing that by nano confining nickel inside manganese oxide, you can get oxygen generation at a much lower voltage uh, than if you just have nickel oxide by itself. So we're really trying to play this out. We're trying to look at how uh, we can use this even to um, lower the loading or make precious metal catalytic systems. It turns out that precious metals are really good catalysts for water splitting. However, precious metals like iridium and ruthenium, they're really expensive. So what we're trying to do is to nano confine iridium and ruthenium to make it, to make the intrinsic activity a uh, very high such that we can make catalytic systems that utilize very little amounts of iridium and ruthenium um, to lower the cost of developing these materials. So that's kind of a second project that we have going on. Um, we also have exper uh, ex uh, experiments that are looking at carbon dioxide reduction, electro uh, electrocatalytically uh, reduction of carbon dioxide, and, uh, and also actually dinitrogen reduction. So that's really short uh, summary of what we have going on in our laboratory. Great, Dan, thank you very much for the rapid fire uh, presentation. Um, essentially the chemistry department has uh, about 25 uh, faculty in total, each of whom has their own active research program spanning all the areas of uh, chemistry. And I just briefly want to um, review that and then talk a little bit about some of the um, issues related there. So um, let me share my screen. I will share this presentation with you also, uh, if you want. So, so um, as you've seen from the video, our, camp, our campus is very much an urban campus. We, our university is uh, over a hundred years old. It's quite large, approximately the 28th largest in the US with almost 40,000 students, uh, um, a quarter of whom are graduate students. Um, Temple is a full service university in the sense that it offers essentially almost every scientific, every academic discipline, and as such is a very large provider of professional education. Um, in the past uh, two decades, Temple has had major investment in uh, basic sciences and in fact, the Dean of our College of Science and Technology, Professor Michael Klein, who's a theoretical chemist, is actually one of the most cited uh, scientists in the world. And, and his presence as well as that of other eminent researchers at Temple leads Temple to have a very high Google uh, Scholar um, ranking in its uh, citation. Um, our um, chemistry department is what I would call a medium-sized chemistry department by US standards. Um, our 25 faculty each have research groups ranging number from you know five uh, or so students. Um, none of the groups really exceed about a dozen uh, students. 
Uh, because we're in Philadelphia, we are in close proximity to other institutions with whom we have close ties and collaborations. Um, the current faculty uh, has you know, been undergoing expansion. So here are some of the faculty who were recruited in the past decade or so with the goal to reach 25 to 30 new faculty. And a lot of these, um, I would say the basic, the composition of the department has completely changed over the past, uh, so in the past decade. Um, the university has invested substantially in uh, basic sciences, a wonderful new science education and research center that opened in 2015. Um, also our library uh, has been, you know, an award-winning winning building was, was opened in fall 2019. Of course, as you realize these days, um, you know, many of the things that we use are available online and our online um, access is, is excellent. Uh, there are further plans for expansion, including a new science building, uh, et cetera, which should happen in the near future. Uh, departmental funding has been uh, increasing uh, steadily, uh, more than doubled in the past uh, 10 years, in large part due to the uh, great hires. Um, one of our colleagues uh, just this week uh, new colleagues, or actually our most junior faculty member, just got a $1.5 million grant from the uh, NIH. Um, the disciplines that are spanned include analytical, biological, organic, chemistry, physical, inorganic, theory, and computational. And I would say that, you know, you can see by the numbers there, um, physical, uh, theoretical, and computational occupies close to half the department. It's a very strong focus in our uh, school. Now, the other thing to, uh, to bear in mind is that um, is, is, the, is the information that's available on the website is, that is that sometimes, and, and this is true for uh, other U.S. universities, sometimes can seem uh, rather daunting. And the reason for this is that there are so many, um, there are so many, um, points of access available to a uh, university. And let me kind of illustrate that uh, a little bit here. So our, um, our college, our, this is our, our, our departmental uh, page. Of course, uh, there is a, um, okay, and, and there you can find information about the uh, graduate program and the faculty. Uh, you can see that each uh, faculty member has a, a listing associated with that listing uh, is a, um, a, a departmental page, but each faculty member also has their own personal page. And if you want the most up-to-date information on that particular faculty member's uh, research, I suggest that you visit the, um, the, 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 the personal page of each uh, faculty member. In addition, the university and the college has uh, information about the application uh, processes. Uh, and when in doubt, I strongly suggest that you um, at, approach the basically reach the reach out to the administrative supports to um, ask uh, questions. But hopefully, what I'll present today will give you a sense of uh, what's happening in. Uh, the process for graduate applications. So let me start that uh, presentation right now. So this presentation is based on materials up, um, generated by the American Chemical Society and is part of a workshop that they organize for students interested in graduate programs. And they usually organize this at their national meetings. Um, and so this is from a few years back but most of the information is really uh, quite uh, up to date and you have a copy of this. So I'll go through it relatively uh, quickly. Um, the main part that we're gonna focus on is getting into uh, graduate school and deciding on which graduate school is best for you because there are a large number of graduate programs in the United States, uh, over a, a hundred uh, graduate programs offering PhDs in chemistry, ranging in size from admitting, you know, less than 10 students a year to close to 100 students a year, uh, going from very urban um, locations to very rural locations, some with very different research fo focuses, et cetera. So there's quite a range of, um, of, of opportunities. So the questions to decide are, how do you prepare yourself for graduate school? Well, you are all um, 
in college pursuing degrees. And so that's the, the, the first part of that. But we'll talk about some of the other elements that are important. How do you choose which schools and programs to apply to? What constitutes a competitive application? And which school uh, is right for you? Because hopefully your applications will result in, in, a, in a few offers and you'll have to make a decision between them. Um, so there are a number of different uh, possible degrees, um, professional science masters, masters of science, but I'm just going to focus on the PhD because that's the, um, the, the I think, the, what's most appropriate uh, for this audience because most of you are interested in becoming independent scholars in a specific scientific area. Here we're going to focus on chemistry. Uh, so let me skip through the professional science master, the master of science if you have questions about those, I'd be happy to answer. Um, one thing to note is that uh, in the United States, uh, students typically go from a bachelor's program, four-year bachelor's degree program. And if they're interested in a PhD, they go directly into the PhD program, uh, which is typically a five-year program. They do not have to uh, gain a master's along the way in order to, to, uh, to enter the PhD program. And that's something to bear in mind. So you don't have to, if you have the right minimum requirements for the PhD program, you do not need to, to get a master's in order to read that. So the goal of the PhD is to um, develop professional scientists capable of independent research and activity. And so research is a key component of the PhD studies. But there are other requirements, which we will discuss a bit. Because you're going to spend five years, uh, you know, pursuing your PhD, I really recommend doing some homework on the institutions to which you apply, because that will make your application more competitive if you show that you understand the opportunities that are available there and how your interests and training uh, match uh, those. So, um, of course, uh, the programs typically have the traditional areas of uh, organic, of, of, of chemistry, um, analytical, inorganic, organic, physical, but you'll see that there is growing uh, interdisciplinary research. And that means uh, um, interdisciplinary in the sense of involving multiple subdisciplines of chemistry, but also uh, developing, involving other disciplines of science and maybe uh, engineering also. Um, the um, program uh, involves, of course, uh, taking some coursework. Every U.S. PhD program requires uh, typically about a year of uh, initial coursework. Um, and that is above and beyond uh, material you would have covered in your undergraduate uh, education. Um, there is... Um, of course, the requirement to present a departmental seminar, in fact, at Temple, you present uh, at least uh, two seminars, and we'll talk about those. One of them is a literature seminar. The other is a the defense of an original uh, research uh, proposal. Um, and also, most importantly, you perform research in an area of specialization. Um, the requirements you need to have before applying to a chemistry program are essentially a good background in chemistry. And somebody who has a chemistry degree, of course, will have that. But I, I mention this because sometimes uh, students from other areas are interested for, in applying to do research in a chemistry program. For example, uh, students from a physics background with an interest in optics and lasers will find excellent research opportunities uh, in a, um, a US uh, program such as uh, Temple University where we have half a dozen researchers whose research is focused on photonics. Um, and um, about four of these use ultra-fast lasers in their research. Uh, but a physics student applying to our chemistry program would at least have to show that, number one, they have a sufficient course background to be able to take graduate courses in their area of specialization, uh, for example, quantum mechanics, statistical thermodynamics, molecular spectroscopy, to be able to, to um, succeed in the graduate program, but also to serve as teaching assistants. So it's not impossible for somebody with a physics background to do a degree, a PhD degree in chemistry, but you need to show that you have the right background. And likewise, somebody coming from biology um, could do research in the area of biochemistry, 
Um, but again, they need to show they have the right uh, background. The other important experience to have for graduate school is research. And I know from many of the students we, we, we've, we've admitted from um, Sri Lanka, particularly University of Peridinia, um, they have a very strong uh, research uh, background. And not only do they have experience, but they also usually have something to show for it. And something to show for it can mean uh, presentations, publications, etc. I realize in the time of COVID, um, these experiences have been dramatically reduced. And I think it's important to be able to explain that in your letter of motivation. Uh, other important um, attributes are uh, oral, uh, written and oral communication skills. Uh, it's important you be able to demonstrate them. Hopefully your letter writers can address issues. Other uh, issues are familiarity with software, <coughs> et cetera. <coughs> so, in trying to select amongst the more than 100 graduate programs, for example, in chemistry, uh, some of the things you got to ask yourself is, is this a program where you're likely to be happy? I mean, you're not going there for a weekend or even a summer. It's a five-year commitment. Uh, so if being in a big city is something that is uh, something you're not comfortable with, then you know, I would recommend that you think about a, a program in a more rural area or, or vice versa, being, you know, in a, in a rural area is, 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 is something you might find challenging, then move to think of a city program. So the location can be important. Do you want to go to a program that's a large program or a small program, et cetera? But most importantly, you want to think about what it is you want to do there. Uh, and you want to ask yourself, does the work of the current faculty appear interesting to you? And it's important to look at the website to get a sense of, of of who are the faculty, what areas they're working in, and to try and think about making a connection between your experience and interests and their research activities. Um, so this is an important part, you know, the, 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 your credentials. So um, typically you want to have uh, your strongest grades in your chemistry and science courses. Uh, I mentioned that because in the United States, students also take courses in other disciplines. Um, typically, uh, U.S. programs require a 3.0 out of 4 GPA uh, to apply. Temple actually has a somewhat higher um, standard, 3.25 GPA. Um, but, you know, exceptions can be made, uh, provided the student has strong uh, performance in coursework uh, related to their discipline. Uh, we understand that um, students who are interested, for example, in computational science, may not necessarily have the same interest and aptitude in uh, experimental organic chemistry and their grades in, in a lab may, may not have been as great as their, their grades in math or, um, or, or physical uh, chemistry. Uh, likewise, we understand that you know, not every semester goes uh, perfectly. If you have a, a GPA which you think has suffered because of a weak semester due to personal reasons or family issues, please share that with your letter writers and ask them to address that. Uh, that's important information that can be uh, useful for us. The GRE um, is, or essentially was an important part of the uh, process. Nowadays, not so important. And in fact, many universities have decided to either downgrade the use of the GREs or actually to eliminate it. Uh, Temple has been evaluating this the chemistry department has decided that it will no longer consider GREs. And the reason for this is that there is substantial uh, evidence in the literature that the GRE is not a good predictor of uh, graduate uh, performance. Uh, indeed, one way of looking at it is the GRE is an exam in one morning or afternoon of your life, uh, whereas your GPA is a more integrated function of your performance over uh, four years, and over a wide range of, of courses. And so it's more valuable and a better predictor of your success in graduate school. Um, another important component is your uh, English language proficiency, uh, usually the uh, TOEFL, but there are other measures that uh, Temple uh, will provide. We do not usually have numbers where we basically say uh, yes or no. The university does have a minimum. And if, if you are below the university minimum, it's very difficult to make a case uh, for admission. But um, we're first of all interested in your uh, scientific and educational background. And then um, probably we will, we will assess your, your English uh, through uh, an interview. 
Um, there are many reasons for that. We need you to be able to, to succeed and, and to make the most of your graduate courses, but you also need to be able to function as a teaching assistant. And so that's very important that your communication skills be strong. Um, a very important part of your application is the statement, uh, sometimes known as the personal statement or the uh, SOP. Now, of course, SOP stands for many things. Uh, we think of it as statement of purpose. Unfortunately, many of the students who write it think of it as a statement of past. And so they spend a lot of time telling us about what they've done and very little about what they want to do. And so not only should it be an example of your best writing, but it should follow the general structure of, of A, what have you done up to now? So that's your past. Uh, how have your life experiences converged on your decision to attend graduate school now? And that's basically the now. And then what do you want to do with your life and career? That's your future. And then you need to tie all this together by explaining how going to the specific school you're applying to can help you achieve those goals. And that's why making doing more than just mentioning the name of the school or even mentioning the name of particular, particular faculty is required. There has to be some thought and you need to make a connection between your experiences and the research of the possible future mentors. And of course, have people read it over and proofread it and you should proofread it uh, carefully yourself. Um, Important things to address are your past research experiences and relevant course experiences uh, that you might have had at your current institution or, you know, summer internships, uh, et cetera. Uh, leadership opportunities that you've had. I mean, we want to create independent scientists, people who are capable of, of creativity and also leadership because many PhDs will go on to have, uh, you know, responsibilities. You'll have responsibilities for leadership within your research uh, group. Um, and you should identify the faculty members who you're interested in, re re in working with and explain why their research is of interest. And so this has to go beyond just citing a few buzzwords. Um, the letters of recommendation are very important. And I want to say this both to the students who are applying, but also to the faculty members who are present. We read those letters very carefully. We read those letters very carefully for what they say. But we also read those letters very carefully for what they do not say. Um, I think most of you uh, who are engaged in this process probably understand that letters should come from faculty, uh, preferably faculty who have um, the opportunity to uh, gauge your aptitude for graduate level uh, research, so especially people who have mentored you. So a research letter from a research mentor is a must, uh, absolutely. Uh, they should be able to provide information that would not be available from your transcripts. Um, what are the particular skills that you have? Um, what, you know, um, useful things did you do in, in the research group? Um, perhaps you had responsibility for uh, safety inspections and that you were able to keep a, a great record and safety inspection of your group. Perhaps you uh, were somebody who was very helpful to other students. Perhaps you came up with a solution to uh, improve the yield of a process or accelerate it or whatever. But um, the more specifics that letters can, can provide, the, the, the better. Um, saying that a student is very creative is one thing, but saying that a student is very creative and giving the example of how they solved a particular problem or were able to fix an apparatus using you know, minimal tools or whatever really goes a, a long way uh, to providing substance to a state, the statement, the student is very creative. Um, letter, the, when you're asking for your <clears throat> letter writers to write for you, uh, you need to give them time. I'm sure that your faculty are, are busy. Uh, they probably have letters to write for, for many students. Uh, so you need to give them time, but you also need to give them information. Uh, very useful to provide, of course, your, 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 your CV, a copy of your statement of purpose, uh, they may be able to give you some feedback on that. Uh, hopefully you, you are getting feedback from your faculty on that. Uh, the other thing is to remind them 
of what you think are your attributes. What is it that you, that they might know that you did? Uh, maybe you presented uh, an excellent paper in your class and like, give them a copy of that paper and remind them that, you know, you'd received, you know, the, the top grade or second highest grade or something in, in, in that particular class. Um, remind them of what you, how you contributed to research. Um, faculty are busy, uh, they interact with many students and you need to do the best <clears throat> to remind them of what it is that, that makes you stand out. Uh, in, in their memory, uh, providing, of course, the, the faculty with the deadlines, et cetera. Um, and, and, you know, um, most of this is done online these days. Uh, and so you can actually check as to whether letters have been submitted, et cetera. And you should, you should uh, do so and gently remind uh, faculty about them. So deadlines, other important issue. Uh, most deadlines are what we call um, rolling uh, deadlines. I would think of the deadlines more as a target date. Uh, you preferably want to get your materials in before the target date rather than afterwards. Um, but that doesn't mean that we that applications that are reviewed that arrive late will not be reviewed. However, the later they arrive, the less consideration they will receive. Uh, in particular, uh, if there are special um, uh, fellowship opportunities. Those typically go to student to applications that are ready earlier rather than later. Um, Temple University has a, I think a currently a, a Department of Chemistry has a, I think a mid uh, December deadline. Uh, so, but that doesn't mean that we wait until December fifteenth, for example, to open the box and look at the application. We will probably begin looking at applications in late November, early December. And uh, if we see particularly uh, impressive applications, we will begin making offers before the deadline for applications. Uh, likewise, we will continue uh, reviewing applications well into January or February, uh, depending on the need of particular areas and uh, the responses of the students to whom we make uh, offers to. Um, there are, of course, application fees. I realize that these can represent a, print, an, um, a considerable burden. Um, I have a few words to say about that. Number one, you can think about them as an investment in your future. Uh, and it, but given that you probably want to apply to more than one school, uh, multiple application fees can represent a, a lot of money. So most schools will, apply, will offer application fee waivers. And there are usually two components in uh, the waiver request. First of all, there, is a, there needs to be some need. And I think if you can demonstrate that there is some need financially for that, that that's a good. But you also have to have a strong application. Uh, and usually the, the schools will ask for a review of, of your uh, application materials in the consideration of the fee waiver. Um, so... Uh, the fact that you do not get an application fee waiver uh, can be due to a variety of um, reasons. It doesn't, uh, the, the university may have a, a limited budget uh, to do that, um, but it might give you some feedback as to the strength of your application for that particular institution. Um, I mean, a temple typically would not give a fee waiver to a student who to whose application we feel uh, would not meet our uh, our minimum uh, requirements. The other thing to bear in mind is that asking for an application fee waiver is not a negative. In fact, it is not even taken into consideration in the ultimate uh, decision. So it, it, it don't, don't think of it as something that would lower your chances. So once you have an offer, uh, well, now you're in a much better position. Uh, you should check it carefully, uh, learn about the uh, details of the stipend, et cetera. I will say that if you're admitted to a PhD program in chemistry in a major program, such as that of Temple University, you will be given uh, full financial support uh, as long as you are in good standing for the duration of your studies. Currently, the stipend at Temple is uh, for this year uh, 28500 uh, Dollars. That actually includes the uh, medical uh, insurance. Um, and uh, Philadelphia, though it's a large city, is relatively uh, in, an inexpensive, relatively inexpensive East Coast city. And I would say our students live uh, well, and, and, and many of our international students actually send money home, uh, frankly, based on their stipend. So I would say that it is, it is, it is more than adequate. 
But I would certainly reach out to students, perhaps you know, upperclassmen who have gone to that particular university um, from your institution, to ask them about the environment. Um, and so that's, um, and I'll talk about opportunities to do that in a little bit. Um, so have a look at what the offer uh, efforts. And if there are any details that are unclear, you can ask questions. Now that you've been made an offer, it's clear the university is interested in you and you are in kind of a, a bargaining position. Now, you can't exactly bargain to change the stipend. That's really not going to uh, happen. But you certainly can learn about the, uh, the conditions and have more details about what's going on. Now, <clears throat> this is an app, uh, a presentation that is made for uh, students in the United States. And so when they say visit, uh, in pre-pandemic years, we would have thought, well, that means you have to get on a bus or get on a plane and go visit. Well, last year, we had our, our graduate recruiting open house as a virtual event uh, because we did not have uh, want students coming in person to visit. And because it was a virtual in-person event, we were able to open it up to international students. Um, so visiting uh, a school can mean a virtual visit. Um, and it's the best way to learn about the program by talking to the faculty and the students there and getting a sense of what life is like. You know, is there community? Are the students happy there? Are they doing well? Um, would, and, and also to consider the, the facilities and infrastructure the university offers and the location. So um, in selecting a school, another very important factor is to consider and identify a few faculty who are of interest, certainly more than one. Uh, because if you apply to a university and your faculty member of interest is no longer there by the time you arrive, then uh, you have a little bit of a problem. Uh, they might not be there because they might have left. Uh, they might have uh, retired. Um, Academics in the United States is a little bit like professional sports. Uh, players change teams not too infrequently. I would say that Temple has been very good at recruiting faculty uh, and retaining the vast majority of them and, and, and helping them succeed in having well-funded programs. But occasionally, some of our faculty do move to other universities. So do identify several faculty whose research is of interest. Uh, think about the different requirements of programs. Some programs require you to take classes in all disciplines uh, as part of your graduate um, education. At Temple, we want you to focus on the area of, of specialization. Um, and most importantly, I think, is you know, what is the community amongst the graduate students? They are going to be your, 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 your fellow co-workers, et cetera. Um, the funding, all I can say is that if you're admitted to a PhD program in chemistry at Temple University, you will be provided with uh, full funding. Okay, I think that uh, there are other um, things in that presentation. Uh, I certainly encourage you to look at it uh, and read about it. Um, another document I want to share with you is this uh, magazine that is... Um, again, made by the American Chemical Society. And it is uh, it contains a number of articles uh, that go into more detail about some of the topics that we have discussed. And I would suggest that you definitely read something like the personal statement pointers uh, and the article on getting that great letter of recommendation. Uh, these are two very useful articles uh, for students uh, applying to graduate school. So please, Look at this. This is the kind of uh, advice that we're, we share with uh, students in the United States. Um, and I think it is just as relevant for international applications. So at this point, uh, I'm going to uh, stop sharing. Uh, with 500 participants, I am certainly um, wondering how we're going to handle questions. But I think the best thing would be to write questions into the chat. And I will do my best to address these as they come in. Um, and that's it from me. So uh, I think we can move on to the question and uh, answer portion of the program. So 
So if you have questions, please. Professor Eric, uh, Professor Eric? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's an amazing talk and uh, excellent and extensive information about the graduate program and the application process in the United States and particularly in the Temple University. And also thank you very much, Professor Daniel, about the, giving us an introduction about, the, about his research group. So this is the question and answer session. And I think we got like uh, more than 500, uh, I mean, uh, 500 people in the uh, Zoom and also 50, about 50 people in the YouTube channel as well. So people will have, definitely will have so many questions for you, sir. So let's see how we can, uh, uh, we can tackle this. Okay, so please go ahead and with your question and unmute yourself uh, and go ahead and uh, go ahead with your questions. Students. Hi, Eric. It's me, Gavin here again. Uh, Eric, there are other students as well. There are some engineering students, those who are interested in getting some advice from you. Uh, in addition sure. to yeah. the wonderful advices that you have given to the chemistry students, could you extend that to other five disciplines as well? I, I can certainly uh, uh, try to do that based on, on the questions uh, that they have. I do also want to make an, another point, which I should have mentioned, is that, you know, many of your faculty are, you know, have uh, experience of, um, you know, U.S. and European graduate programs. There, there are major differences between those. And particularly faculty who are uh, more recent graduates can give you up-to-date information about their experiences in the U.S. So you have valuable sources of information. Um, they have perhaps not been on the graduate admissions committee of the university, and so I can give you a different uh, perspective, but there is information there available. So I do see a question saying, what would be the benefits of an MSc program? So in the United States, the MSc is usually taken by students who want to go uh, directly into the workforce and are not interested in a purely research, open-ended research um, five-year um, experience. Uh, the scholarship application process, it is part of the application process. When you apply for that, you are immediately considered for uh, the funding. Uh, and usually you will get a, a, a letter of admission, though the letter of, of funding might come separately. Okay. <clears throat> In the U.S., do private universities? Yes. So if you're going to a major program in... Um, in, 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 in a graduate chemistry program, you will receive full financial support, whether it's a private or a public university, there'll be no difference there. Um, if publications are not done yet, is that cause, so basically I'm asking if all your publications are not written, is that gonna prevent you from getting your PhD? Well, uh, many of my students graduate with you know, papers that are uh, published, of course, some papers are submitted, some papers are in the process of being submitted or written up, and some papers may span more than one student's uh, career. And so, uh, the, yes, so that's, it's, it's, you, it's very difficult to finish everything in science, uh, so um, it's, it's, it's a process. Uh, our university does accept the uh, IELTS uh, as a substitution for the TOEFL. In fact, there are, uh, quite, there are several tests that we do accept. The chances of, well, at Temple, if you have a 3.0 GPA, uh, it, it kind of depends. I mean, if your grades are particularly strong, let's say, for example, you want to do computational chemistry and your grades in your, um, you know, general in your general chemistry lab and organic chemistry lab are poor and that's what brings your gpa down but your grades in in math and physical chemistry and quantum mechanics are excellent then that will compensate for your 3.0 gpa we do not basically look at things as a simple numerical thing we look at your whole application we don't reject an application just based on one numerical number we try to have a holistic evaluation of the application how long would a master's in paleontology take? Unfortunately, I cannot really answer the question. Um, paleontology uh, is not a discipline that I believe we have in our College of Science and Technology. Um, we do have people in the um, biology department. 
who have interest in that area, actually from a computational point of view, looking at uh, genomics and things like that, but also people in our earth and environmental sciences uh, department who may have interest in that area. So you'd have to look at that. Usually a master's in the United States is, is a one to two year uh, endeavor. Okay, biosystems, technology, undergraduate, when to go further studies in environmental science. Well, that, that is a really interesting. I think that our environmental sciences program has opportunities both in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences, but also in the uh, Department of Chemistry. Uh, in uh, considering whether to apply to one or the other, you really need to consider who you'd like to work for, who's doing research that interests you in the Earth and Environmental Sciences Department or the Chemistry Department, and then making the case that your background in biosystems technology has prepared you not only for the research, but also to take the graduate classes and to serve as a teaching assistant in, for example, the introductory courses. So do we need to submit GRE scores if the GRE requirement is optional? No, if it's optional, you don't have to. And in fact, at Temple, we actually do not require the GRE scores and we will not consider them. We don't think that they are useful. That's why we decided to, to, um, to eliminate that uh, requirement. Uh, I can share with your, your, your faculty some interesting literature on this, but um, yes, um, definitely it's a movement in the United States to move away from these standardized scores uh, for a variety of reasons, not least the fact that they typically represent your performance on one day in your life. Um, there is no preferred English test, IELTS or TOEFL. Uh, most universities require will accept either. Uh, and in addition, uh, they have other, there are other um, English tests that are accepted. IELTS and TOEFL are simply the most common, not better to do one or the other. They have slightly different uh, formats, and you have to think about where you will do uh, best in each one. Um, when applying for a PhD, is it a must of a research publication? Does work experience count in? So uh, clearly, um, the more experience and the more you have to show for that experience, the stronger a candidate you are going to be. So. You know, if you've done research and you have made a presentation at your university, that's already a plus. If you have contributed to a publication, that is possibly even better. If you are the first author on, on a research publication, that's even better still. Um, if you have more than one publication. Uh, if there are publications that are in preparation, please ask your research mentor to address that in letter, and in particular, to address the question of what was your role in the research that led to that publication? Does work experience count in? Yes, if it's relevant. Um, so if you have research work experience, uh, certainly you should explain what it is in your CV. Uh, if it's relevant to your future research, then you might uh, talk about it. You may, it might be relevant because you have learned to function independently, um, to take initiative, to work as part of a team, uh, etc. Lots of different things. Okay, so if a U.S. dual uh, citizen graduate in Sri Lanka comes to U.S. for graduate study, <coughs> so you are, that's, that's a good question. Um, you, if you're, it doesn't matter whether you're a U.S. citizen or not, if your um, education is in um, a, an institution uh, outside the United States, typically you have to take uh, a foreign language test, whether you're a U.S. citizen or not. Now, being a U.S. citizen does not guarantee that you speak perfect English. Um, in fact, there, I'm sure there are U.S. citizens who have perhaps, well, anyway. So... Um, there are no particular, we don't have quotas for US citizens uh, or non-citizens. Um, the, the key issue is to have a, a strong application. So I would say, in my opinion, does not necessarily make a huge difference. You might be eligible as a US citizen for special fellowships that a non-citizen might be eligible for. And those are things that you could certainly uh, take. So how important are extracurricular activities and internships? Well, I would say extracurricular activities and internships are different. Internship is usually a professional experience. 
uh, which should have enhanced your research uh, capabilities or, or other academic capabilities. Your extracurricular activities, well, I mean, it could be uh, volleyball or badminton. Well, I mean, it shows that you have other interests, and perhaps, you know, um, and, uh, you know, perhaps if you've been the captain of the team, that shows you have a certain leadership ability. But extracurricular activities are probably not as important as internships. And the most important thing for a PhD, where you're going to mainly do research, is an understanding of what research is, the challenges of research, and the ability to produce in a research environment. How do we know whether the particular university is asking for the GRE strongly or not at all? Well, if you look on their application webpage, and let me just share the application web webpage with for um, our school, it should say that um, you we are not looking for the program. So let's go to the. I'm going to share now. A little slow here. I'm going to share my screen. So this is uh, the page on the College of Science Technologies uh, page for um, graduate programs. Uh, here are the doctoral programs that are involved, their master's programs as before. Here you can get program information, for example, for chemistry. Um, and it will talk about the, the different uh, disciplines, et cetera, the program requirements, classes and curriculum, tuition and fees, et cetera. And then we can go to program details, for example. There are lots of different sites, uh, lots of information here. And they can talk, for example, about the uh, admission. Uh, they talk about letters of references, standard of taste. They say it's optional. Um, and in fact, uh, I would say that we should update that and say that we actually do not consider it um, at the moment. And so here you found information saying that it's, it's optional. Another uh, page that might tell you uh, something about that is hopefully like... like and go to the chemistry page. So let me just navigate here. Okay, now so I'm going back to my research group. Chemistry department here, we have a, a graduate page. We talk about apply. So here, uh, we talk about the Please note the chemistry department no longer requires GRE scores as part of the application program. You can provide them, but we typically do not pay any attention to them. Um, here we talk about the uh, you know, TOEFL tests, you know, we accept the IELTS test. We also um, use the PTE. Uh, so there are a number of, uh, of um, English language tests we can take. Okay, let me go back to the uh, questions, which were going at rapid. Uh, Professor Eric, may I disturb yes. you for a minute? Uh, I think uh, two students have questions. Uh, they raise their hands in the Zoom. Okay, they'd like to speak. Okay. Yes, yeah. at three. Do that. I've, I've been reading the questions from the chat. Oh, uh, okay, sir. I understand. But let's, please, if you'd like to call upon those students, uh, let's have them ask their questions. Yes, of, of, of course. Atri? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, I'm Atri from the Department of Chemistry, University of Peradeniya. So actually, I was wondering, uh, now, uh, given the pandemic situation, uh, review articles has become an option instead of the research, uh, the researches that we are usually doing. Because uh, of this uh, pandemic situation, we can't actually go to the university and so on. So in case if we could not do uh, our research work, and instead we will have to uh, go for a review article, Will that be a negative? Will that look bad on our CV? Well, you know, ideally you'd like to have done research, but I think that you need to address that in your statement of purpose and say, look, you know, because of COVID, in-person research was not an opportunity. And so essentially I participated in uh, the research and for a review article on the following topic. And, you know, 
explain how that review article has influenced, uh, writing this review article has influenced your interest in chemistry. Uh, you should also ask your faculty to address that letter of recommendation. Um, I mean, this is a problem worldwide. I mean, our students, undergraduate students, for most of last academic year, were not able to get into the research laboratory because of, of COVID. Uh, currently, you know, everybody, we're back in in-person classes uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, and undergraduate research is a possibility. Although, you know, we are, you know, carrying out, you know, the usual public health um, considerations in terms of number of people in the lab, you know, vaccinations, et cetera. So I think you have, you have to take, well, it, you know, there, you can't move, you can't change the past. And the past is that, you, unfortunately, your research opportunities were, were eliminated. And so that's, um, you have to make the best case of what you've learned from your review article, which can be a very valuable experience. Also. Thank you, sir. Thank you. That sure. answered my question. Sachin? Uh, yeah, uh, hello, Professor Eric. I am Sachin Tendakon, a final year student annexed to the Department of Chemistry, University of Peradine. My question is a, a pretty general one, actually, uh, due to this COVID pandemic. I mean, are there any uh, particular vaccine requirements for the students from Sri Lanka? I mean, international students who are trying to apply for the <coughs> USA. I mean, uh, let's say if you take Sri Lanka as an example, the vaccine availability may be a bit different compared to USA. So let's say a student who has been- Well, okay, so let's, let's just stop the question, start. We are September, 2021. If you're admitted, you're going to be admitted to arrive sometime in the middle of August, 2022. We could be in a completely different pandemic by then. Okay, so unfortunately, uh, that's it, it's 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 such a moving landscape that I can't even begin to think about answering that question. Uh, the vaccine situation will have evolved dramatically by then. Uh, the requirement the requirements are not requirements of the university. Well, they could be requirements of the university. We currently require all of our students to be vaccinated or to have some medical or religious exemption. Uh, that's effective October 15th. And that's because our city required that. Um, and that is the case of many US universities. In order to enter the United States, the government has its own requirements about that. But asking me a question today, September 21, 21 about the situation in August 2022. Unfortunately, I I'm, I wouldn't even begin to give a guess. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. So we have we have students who have come in, international students who've come in and, and been admitted uh, from a variety of countries. Um, you know, including uh, India, uh, Bangladesh. I think we may have had students from Sri Lanka come in also. Um, and you know, they met whatever requirements were needed. But yeah, unfortunately, this is something that it's very difficult for anybody to guess on. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Sashini has a question. Sashini Marasimha. Yes, madam. Can you give me another minute? Yes, go ahead. Hello. Yeah. Um, so, sir, uh, I'm from uh, the, the Department of Radiography. I'm not uh, doing science, of course. I mean, chemistry. Sure. But uh, I won't know any if you can give any advice. Um, I need to shift from my field for uh, another subject, uh, particularly psychology-like thing. So, uh, but I see many difficulties in addressing that uh, it, it seems to be a, a dramatic uh, shift from one field to another. So I plan to study in USA, but uh, now in this moment, I am totally like um, frustrated about that. So uh, what are the advices you can give uh, me in case of uh, selecting another uh, field? I mean, shifting from one field to another. Okay, well, I think the, the, the one thing I will say, I think it's very brave of you to, to do that. And I think it's a very good idea in the sense that I don't think it's, I don't think it's a good idea to be uh, you know, not fully fulfilled in one field when you think that another field could possibly be much more rewarding. However, that requires that 
certainly to enter a, a graduate program in uh, psychology would require you to have some undergraduate training in that area. Um, and I think you need to look at the requirements of each program and to uh, frankly ask the uh, questions of the admissions committees of that and say, look, I'm, I'm really interested in this area. Uh, what are the requirements for students to enter? Do they need to have a number of uh, undergraduate psychology classes? Should they have had uh, some particular experiences? I think you need to spend some time investigating uh, that. Uh, in the US, it is not uncommon to, to shift uh, areas or to come back to graduate school later in life um, and uh, to have had a professional experience and then to come back to graduate school. I mean, the majority of our students do go straight through, but that's not, um, not, not the, the only one. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Sure, I thank you. I see a lot of questions in the uh, chat and I would like to uh, try and uh, deal with them uh, also. And I'll take some more in-person uh, questions. Um, we had uh, extracurricular activities, uh, GRE, pure biology programs. So, there, so biology, um, I think you need to, when you're looking at biological sciences, you need to look at the medical. So we're going to have MSc and PhD both in the Department of Biology in uh, our, our college, but also in the biomedical programs of our medical school. In addition, if you are interested, for example, in uh, certain areas of biology, it might be that they, for example, biochemistry would be in a chemistry department. Uh, it could be that bioinformatics is in a uh, computer science department. So when you're thinking about pure biology uh, programs, you, you need to think about not only the, the main campus, but also the medical school, and also a variety of departments. Um, question about PhD in computer science, do recommendations need to be the same discipline? <clears throat> if you're applying for a PhD in a particular area, the letters that come from the, the experts in the discipline are always going to be stronger than coming from a distant discipline. So having an English professor write for you if you were doing a PhD in computer science is probably not as useful as having somebody who can really evaluate your ability to be successful in a graduate degree in uh, computer science. Okay, are there any specific COVID vaccination? Uh, again, we, we can't really think about that uh, for a while. Do you need to contact a particular research supervisor before applying to the university application system? That's a very interesting question, and let me try and address that in general. In chemistry programs in the United States, typically you are admitted by the department, not by an individual faculty member. In uh, some programs, uh, for example, typically engineering programs for the PhD, or graduate programs in um, Europe, you are typically sponsored by a faculty member. And so if you don't have a, 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 an individual, a, a particular faculty uh, a mentor, then uh, you, you will have a problem. So, guys, could you mute? If, they're not, if, you're, if you're not speaking, could you mute? It's a little distracting. Um, Nevertheless, when you're reaching out to a chemistry department, it is good. It's not a bad idea to reach out to a supervisor. Uh, but hopefully you have a question which goes beyond, are you taking students? Most faculty who are publishing, uh, you can almost be certain that they are planning to take students. Um, um, and you can always ask the, the graduate coordinator about that. So having a three years bachelor's and master's in chemistry, how would that affect admissions process. So we understand, for example, that in, in many countries, the bachelor's degree is a three-year degree. Typically, that's not considered sufficient for admission. There are exceptions to a graduate program in the United States, and so we would require a master's. Um, the more experience you have, the better. It shows, it's not, only, it's not only a question of what you've learned, but it also shows that you have a commitment to the discipline and to uh, research. So if you want to apply for another major like chemical engineering as a chemistry graduate student, what uh, things should be considered before applying? Well, I think you need to motivate. You know, why is it that you did a chemistry degree and you now want to go to chemical engineering? Well, it might be because there is a particular 
area of research, which is, you know, found in that particular chemical engineering department. Um, I think you need to think about the requirements of the program. Uh, they may have, you know, courses, for example, in transport, fluid transport that you may not have had as an undergraduate uh, and other things to consider. So you need to think about, ask about the requirements uh, for that. And you need to think about making the case that your chemistry background might actually give you a unique perspective. You know, like you have a more molecular view of the world that would be interesting for the chemical engineers. Is there an age limit to apply for the PhD? Absolutely no. Either how young you can be or the main thing is that you have the requirements and that your letters of recommendation support that. Um, if you have been in away from studies for a long time, let's say you've been out of, you've been out of school for five, 10 years, then you're gonna to have to think about, well, what is it that those five and 10 years, how have they improved your ability to make the most of a graduate program as opposed to limited? You may have family responsibilities, you know, that could be seen as a negative. On the other hand, it might be, it might've made you a very efficient uh, manager and organizer of your time. And so you can spin that as a positive. Is it possible to enter job industry after completing MSc for a foreign student? Um, so everything is possible. The question is, is it likely? And it depends on the economy. At the moment, I would say that in the United States, the economy is good. And so, you know, there, there is a, they are looking for people with jobs. Typically, uh, you have the opportunity after your degree to do something called uh, op, uh, practical training. And that practical training is, allows you to be employed in the U.S. for a period of one to two years. Uh, the visa. Um, some employers uh, may be, I mean, if, it, if an employer has a choice between somebody who needs help with their visa paperwork and an equivalent applicant who does not need help with their visa paperwork, chances are they're going to choose the person who does not need additional help. Uh, so it's a, a difficult thing. Many of our students remain in the United States. Most of our students go to industry. I mean, I'll, mind you, there are about 2,000 PhDs in chemistry uh, graduating every year. And there are about, you know, maybe maximum, you know, 150 or 200 faculty openings a year. And so the vast majority, 90% or so, you know, do not go into academia. And so they go principally into industry. Um, can you talk about visa related things and uh, the up and down flight tickets? Okay, so um, if you're admitted to the graduate program, the university will take care of the initial paperwork for you to be able to apply for a visa. However, they will not take care of your visa application. You will have to make the appointment with the consulate and fill out the paperwork, et cetera. Now, the cost of tickets is certainly an issue. And again, you have to think about this as an investment in your future. Uh, but from a chemistry point of view, uh, if you are you know, going to be getting a stipend, which is on the order of $2,200, $2,300 a month, and your airline ticket costs you, let's say, the round numbers, $1,000, I think you will be able to reimburse the price of the ticket, uh, certainly within half a year, or, you know, if, if you need to borrow the money. Again, the best thing is to talk to uh, students who have already uh, done this journey themselves. Uh, though I realize that, you know, it, it's easy for me to say that, uh, and it's a little bit more difficult to actually do it in practice. But I would say it's definitely uh, possible. Um, question is, if we fail to uh, conduct in in undergraduate research due to the current lockdown, will it impact negatively a chance of getting a position in university? Uh, I think you need to show your, your lack of research by perhaps doing a literature study, um, et cetera. But I think the other thing is that you've had laboratory courses. So people can, you can get somebody, your letter writers to comment on your aptitude there, um, et cetera. Is it compulsory to complete GRE for Temple? No, uh, the GRE is optional for the chemistry department. And in fact, I can tell you the chemistry department does not consider it as part of the application. In general, when it was considered in the past, we considered it if it was very good or it was very bad. If the GRE was very bad, then we looked really even more carefully at your grades. And if it was very good, we would say, well, is that consistent with your grades? 
but really it's it's the grades, your GPA, your performance in individual courses is what we're doing. We're not looking, we're not we're not looking at thousands of applications and just using a numerical scale to 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 eliminate the, the number of applicants. Okay, I'm doing an MSc in science in Sri Lanka with 3.1 BSc GPA after MSc. Is there a chance to apply to your university for higher studies? Well, I mean, there's always a chance. The question is, what do you want to do? Um, you know, uh, a 3.1. So we understand that a 3.25 GPA is not the same from every institution. Uh, the, the thing is, we need to look at, well, why you have your 3.1 GPA? Are there some courses in which you did particularly well or other courses in which you were not so strong? Um, uh, we also realize that your performance in the classroom doesn't always correlate with your performance in um, laboratory. I mean, and the most important thing about research is that there's a certain uh, tenacity and, and that, that's needed to be successful there. And those are the qualities that we hope your letter writers can speak to. Um, if we have done undergraduate research in another field and expect to do a PhD in another field, how would it affect? Well, it depends. I mean, if, if you've done undergraduate research in chemistry and you want to work in physics, uh, or biology, the main question is, how do you deal with research? How do you deal with the setbacks in research? It's not so much the techniques that you've learned. I mean, in my research, people use ultra-fast lasers and they use scanning tunneling microscopes and ultra-high vacuum chambers. And I can tell you that 99% of the students who come to my research group have never had experience with any of these. And I had no experience with these prior to my starting research. Is that a negative? Well, you know, it's the most important thing is, do you understand what the research process is? Do you understand that you do not get results every day? Do you understand that some of your hypotheses don't work out, that some of your experiments fail? How do you overcome that adversity? How do you keep going on? Um, that's probably a more important thing. So the, um, the undergraduate research should have introduced you to the idea of research. It's not the particular skills. We are not trying to hire technicians. We're trying to hire people who have an intellectual interest and an aptitude to be successful in research. So make the case that your undergraduate research in another field has prepared you for the general area, but also make a connection with the particular research of the faculty you're interested in. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I think you need to individualize your statement of purpose. That's a, I see so many statements of purpose that could be written for any university where just they replace the name of the university or they replace the name of the faculty and the same letter could go anywhere. It's really sad. You're planning to spend five years of your life, uh, spend a little bit of time doing research on the institution. How to waive the application fee? Well, you apply for an application fee uh, waiver. Uh, in fact, let me just go back to that web page and you'll find an equivalent thing here. So hopefully I've got the right page up. So application process, uh, deadlines, Okay, students with demonstrated financial need may apply for a fee waiver. And this page takes you to the instructions for the application fee waiver. Most departments will have the same uh, thing. So you can, you can look for that. Okay, let's go back to our questions. Um, I mean, I'm happy to answer these questions. I just need to find where I was with the questions. Okay, paleontology, we went past that. On um, age limit. Okay, uh, okay, I think I'm back in the place. Okay, is it crucial to contact supervisors? So I think you want to, most, Students do not apply, do not contact all the supervisors that they're planning to um, list in their letter of recommendation. Um, I think that you can certainly contact supervisors. That's not a requirement, but you should know that you have some sense of their research. You might contact students in their group. Um, if someone gets a GPA, so not critical that you contact the supervisor, uh, but in engineering, it probably is. Uh, if you don't have a faculty sponsor, it might be more difficult. Each uh, area has its own requirements. If someone has GPA less than three, what's the optional way to apply? Well, 
There are a number of different things you can do. First of all, I would say that you probably want to enhance your research experience. Secondly, you want to say about taking additional courses um, in your home country, uh, maybe a second master's to improve your GPA. Um, another thing is that we have some students in the United States who are a little anxious about going to graduate school or feel their graduate school credentials are, their credentials are not good enough. They go and do a master's program rather than going directly with their bachelor in order to improve their competitivity. Is it too late to apply for the spring 22 semesters? Well, not probably. Pro we're getting close to the end. We are beginning, we're beginning to review applications for spring 2022. Typically, we admit far fewer students in the spring than in the summer. And there are a number of reasons for that. Um, coursework, you're not aligned for the coursework. Um, we have far fewer applications for spring, and so the pool is smaller. And so, um, but if there are very strong candidates applying in spring 2020 in the spring pool who would be admitted in the fall pool, then we would go ahead and admit them. Um, a student who would be too late for the spring, we will simply defer them for consideration in the fall. Um, okay, more questions. Is Temple University a good campus for a student doing data science at the BSC? Um, yeah, we have great programs in data science. I would say computational science in general is a very strong area at uh, Temple Universities. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm wondering if you're asking whether you want to go to the bachelor's uh, program or what. But I would say do your finish your bachelor's program where you are and look at the possibilities uh, at U.S. universities. But Temple certainly has very good opportunities. We have a professional science master's. We have lots of people doing computational studies in chemistry and biology, of course, computer and information sciences, et cetera. Um, Okay, not able to do pandemic, not able to do a final research project, needed experiments, instead do a broad literature review. Well, I think you're going to find yourself in the same situation as many students. Uh, you're not alone. Does lecturing experience count in? Well, it does because we want you to serve as a teaching assistant, uh, <clears throat> but it's not the most important thing. Um, the most important thing is your aptitude for graduate research. Uh, you will be supported as a TA, certainly in your first year. And so having experience as a communicator would be great. Um, in general, being an effective communicator is important for your scientific career. Um, how is a student's application who wants to change disciplines from her undergraduate scene? We'll see negative or positive. I think if your motivation is strong and if you have the required coursework and you can explain why you want to do what you want to do, now, if you want to go from you know, biology to psychology, that's a big jump, as we talked about before. Uh, but a you know, student who can show they have the required uh, coursework, et cetera, and the required motivation and other things, you know, it's, it's certainly a possibility. How long is the PhD candidate selection process? Okay, so uh, typically our applications arrive in you know, December, maybe beginning of January. We start reviewing applications, certainly end of November, beginning of December. Uh, and, you know, depending on, you know, how our, you know, the admissions goes, we can be making offers up through March uh, or even April. Students may not hear from us until then. But the vast majority of our offers are made in January and beginning of February. Is chemical physics a developing PhD area and how hard is it to get in? So chemical physics <clears throat> essentially is the intersection between um, physics and chemistry, or one of the intersections. Um, I say it has a long-standing tradition. There are a number of faculty in our department whose area research could be described as chemical uh, physics. And um, it's some universities have special programs in that. I think we actually have uh, the possibility of doing a, a, a the, the, we actually have a concentration called chemical physics. Uh, typically, most students don't apply to that. They really apply to physical chemistry or physics, uh, depending on what they want to do. But I would say that uh, it's a generally, it's a very strong area at uh, Temple University. And it's, yes, it's competitive. You know, graduate school is competitive. You need to show that you have a good 
undergraduate training and an understanding of research. So um, are there scholarships related to MSc in biochemistry, analytical chemistry? Um, so there are far fewer scholarships available for MSc than graduate students. We typically do not support our MSc students with teaching assistantships. Uh, so at the beginning, certainly that, and rarely with research assistantships. Um, I would say that that is uh, less true for programs where there is no PhD program. If you go to a university where the MSc in biochemistry or analytical chemistry is the <clears throat> top, the highest degree, then they probably will have assistantships for the MSc students. Uh, or for some of them. So our private university students, our private university students welcome for schools. There's, we really don't make a big distinction between private and public um, state universities. And really, it's not an issue. Uh, and so I think admission, I mean, you know, there are excellent private universities that are, you know, highly ranked. Uh, there are excellent uh, public universities that are uh, highly ranked. I mean, I would argue that, you know, for example, our chemistry program in is, is competitive with the chemistry program of the uh, University of, of University of Pennsylvania, my alma mater, and certainly much better than Drexel's University. Those are both private institutions. Um, anyway, so I think that it's not, there's not a big distinction in the United States between that. I mean, there's a big distinction in terms of of the regulations that govern those institutions and where they get their money from and the tuition they charge to their undergraduate, but well, that's different. Um, I would say that most of most students completing, uh, you know, BS or MS or PhDs in STEM programs have excellent employment opportunities these days. Age limits for applying to postgraduate studies? No. Is it possible to work as a research assistant if I'm to learn for a master's degree? So um, you can do a master's, which involves a research component, of course. Uh, many of our students do, uh, typically, um, but we typically do not support those students financially. Our financial support is reserved for the PhD students, the students who have committed to a longer and more ambitious uh, degree of, of study. How much is the impact of having a master's degree in doctoral applications? Well, it serves to, um, I think, Equivalent student with a master's degree and student without a master's degree, student with a master's degree is likely to uh, be more competitive. They probably will have publications or presentations. Um, if I have research experience as a research assistant, but none of the field I'm applying to for a graduate program, well, you know, do you have the experience you have? Uh, and I think you need to think carefully about what your, how your past has prepared you for your future. Uh, and you have to make the case that even, you know, if it's not in a particular area, you've learned things from that uh, being a research assistant there. So would taking a one to two year gap, working as a full-time TA contributing to any research be a disadvantage? Well, we're not going to admit you to the graduate program uh, based on your teaching as a primary criterion. It's a research degree. And so really your ability and your aptitude for research is gonna be more important. So I would certainly, if you, if you are interested in a research degree and that's the PhD, then you should be endeavoring to seek out whatever research opportunities you, uh, you can find. Um, and so if you want to explain why you didn't do research during the one or two years, then you should maybe make the case for that. So when selecting a grad school, should I consider the world ranked with grad school? Well, look, let's take it. Well, probably, I don't think any of you will argue with the fact that Harvard is probably the most highly ranked university in the world. Now, if you look at Harvard in chemistry, you'll find that it is very strong in certain areas of chemistry and completely absent in some, certain other areas of chemistry. Uh, Harvard does not have any analytical chemistry. Uh, Harvard's, uh, you know, there are certain other areas where Harvard is not present. So the real question is, what is it that you want to study? What is it that you are passionate about? And where are there faculty doing research in the area you're passionate about? Um, so that's what I think you, sh you should consider. 
The ranking of the university, of course, is not a negligible factor, but the most important thing, in my opinion, is to find a research program that is of interest to you and where you feel that over a course of five years, you are going to be able to make a considerable contribution. Okay, in the case of the absence of undergraduate research, okay, well, you know, no undergrad, the, you, I, I think I've addressed that already. So some of the questions I'm going to skip over. Is it possible to bring a spouse? Um, yes, probably uh, to the US, get a chance for a PhD. Um, the issue is going to be whether the finances, you, whether you can make the case, and I think you need to ask other, other students who've gone in the past, uh, whether um, the financial resources that you have are considered sufficient by the US government for you to support yourself and your spouse. Um, and that's something that uh, is more of a visa question than anything else. It's certainly not impossible for you to get a visa for a spouse, um, but um, it, it's a complicated, it's more of a visa question really than an admissions question. Um, okay, another question. So for a dependent to come along and with ability to work, that is, I would say, even more challenging than getting the spouse to come along. So yeah, you probably will not get a uh, work authorization, but again, it's more of a visa question. Um, if case government has received the results of what? I'm not sure before the application deadline, is it possible to uh, apply with pending results? Well, you have no choice but to apply with what you have. Um, when applying for PhD programs, what is the minimum gap between year of graduation? There is no minimum gap. There's no maximum gap. But the bigger the absence, you need to explain what you've done between your undergraduate degree. Maybe you've done something which is very relevant. Maybe you, your experience working has, has motivated you more to work in a, to do research, et cetera. Um, you can, of course, you know, having, a, you know, ha, uh, having publications helps compensate lower GPA. There's no doubt about it. Some universities specify a different or higher IELTS to be considered for TA. Is that the case for universities? Every university has its own requirements and every university applies them more or less strictly. Um, our chemistry department is, look, I'm not hugely convinced that the TOEFL, I mean, if the TOEFL is very good, it's probably an indication that you have strong English language skills. If it's very bad, it's probably an indication that there might be some issues. If it's somewhere in the middle, it may not tell me that much except that it's not very good or very bad. Um, often we use other methods to evaluate your English. Um, if we admit you, we admit you because we think that you are going to be able to take classes, and that which means your communication skills are sufficient to, to participate successfully in graduate classes and also to serve as, and as a, an assistantship. Um, gap, I mean, everybody has a gap in their resume due to the pandemic. Uh, that's um, just the way. Even admissions, you know, some of some some of you might have gotten into the U.S. last year if it hadn't been for the pandemic. Um, contacting a supervisor always a good idea. Have more than one faculty member on your SOP. Um, environmental toxicology programs. Um, I'm, again, this is the kind of program that could be in biology. It could be in earth and environmental sciences or it could be in chemistry. There are gonna be people working on environmental um, issues in, in chemistry programs, such as my colleague, uh, Dan Strongman, who has an interest in arsenic. May not be exactly what you're asking, but often the research is not necessarily just within a department. Um, you have a, a, a degree in environmental science, environmental engineering, yes, you can uh, apply for that. You just need to look at what the requirements are. But I would imagine that as an environmental scientist, you probably have some of the requirements for environmental engineering. The only thing I would say is that environmental engineering in the United States is often in, a, in, the, in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And so those in, environmental engineers will often have had a civil engineering background. So you need to look at the requirements of a particular institution. Uh, field 
of archaeology and anthropology in their university? I would say that yes, there are. Is there a scholarship process? Most likely. Uh, again, I would search Temple University and archaeology and anthropology or anthropology and, and see what, what's going on there. The funding in STEM disciplines is better than in uh, non-STEM uh, disciplines. Is it difficult to get accepted for uh, a biology PhD than chemistry? It kind of depends on your research area. Uh, I would say we certainly admit more as, uh, students in chemistry than in, in biology at the moment. But if you're applying for biology, you may possibly be able to have opportunities in the area of bioinformatics. As a biology student, you may be able to apply to the biomedical uh, um, sciences program in our medical campus. So there may be other opportunities than just the traditional biology um, uh, degree. Okay. So uh, MSc, in, okay, we've done this thing, possible to get a PhD. Okay, well, I think that if you have a low bachelor GPA and a higher GPA postgraduate, well, I think you need to be able to make the case and talk to your letter writers about what they think is improved. You know, it may be that you have matured. It may be that you've been able to focus better. You've, you've under, 